Let us go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you, God, because you've been good, not just sometimes, but God, you're good all the time. And for that, we give your name the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor because you'll do that. And so, God, we thank you for this opportunity to stand before your presence one more time. And God, we thank you for these that have gathered under the sound of my voice. And we thank you for those that have gathered out there in cyber land on Facebook Live. God, we just want to thank you for every vehicle that you've given us, God, to connect with the people of God. Lord, we thank you right now for all that you are, for all that you do, God. And we will truly give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, in the church yet? Amen. Amen. And amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, please turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. That is in the Old Testament. And it is uh, uh, one of the books of Moses. And we want to read a couple uh, chapters, uh, chapters, a couple verses out of the book of Exodus. I know y'all got nervous when I said chapters. Uh, we may deal with a couple chapters, but we want to look at just two verses out of the book of Exodus. So please get your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Exodus. Uh, and if you could uh, stand for the reading of the word, and we'll go to, to his word uh, as soon as I find the book of Exodus. Uh, I think it's the second book of the Bible right after the book of Genesis. Yeah, okay. All right. Exodus 2, chapter, uh, verses 23 and 24. Exodus 2, verses 23 and 24. And it reads, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard. Somebody say, God heard. God heard. It just felt good to say somebody. You know? <laughs> and God heard their groaning. And God remembered. Somebody say, God remembered. God remembered. God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. I read verse 25 too. And God looked upon the children of Israel. And God had respect unto them. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing, most of all, to the doing of his holy word. Yes. You may be seated in the household of the Lord again. And we again, we want to thank you for joining. For those of you who don't know me, I am uh, Pastor Greg Reeves. I'm the past senior pastor of the Jefferson City Church of God in Christ. And we want to welcome you again to the Jefferson City Church of God in Christ. On yesterday, if you didn't know it, we celebrated what is commonly known as the 4th of July in America. It is the day of our independence from England, a day when we celebrate our victory over the English in the Revolutionary War of 1776. Now, I, I know this may sound like a history lesson, but believe me, I'm going somewhere. Because the sad reality of the American Revolutionary War is that men who fought for their freedom, men who fought to be the architects, if you will, of the Declaration of Independence, men who wrote the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These men that were the architects of freedom, these men that sought to fight for their freedom from England, turned around and enslaved an entire race of people. And if that were not enough, they used the Bible to be able to justify their actions. But I want you to know that the Bible has never justified slavery. Amen. The slavery that was in America was the worst abomination of, of, of slavery ever known to mankind. And I want you to understand why. Because it was based on a biblical principle of kidnapping that the Bible called wrong. The Bible called kidnapping sin. The Bible has always called kidnapping sin. It called kidnapping sin in the book of Exodus, uh, in the book of Numbers, and it also called kidnapping sin in the book of Timothy. First Timothy. So 
God has always not said that this kind of slavery based upon uh, kidnapping was wrong. But less than 100 years later, after 1776, God stepped in because God saw the afflictions of the people in America. And God stepped in and caused America to be divided between the North and the South. And after about 750,000 deaths in the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln announced that all slaves would be set free. Now I want to clarify something that I said, because technically the battle was not against the North and the South. Technically the battle was against the United States of America, against the Confederate States of America. Now come on somebody. You see the South has succeeded from the Union. The South they created their own government. They were rebellious to the United Nations, to the United States. And they flew their own flag, the rebel flag. And if anybody thinks that the rebel flag uh, did not mean racism, did not mean slavery, that flag was flown to keep the South living the way the South lived, to maintain their status quo, which was slavery, on the backs of someone else. But I want you to know that God wants to give you freedom from oppression. Freedom from oppression. God does not want us to be oppressed. So in 1862, the Emancipation Proclamation declared by the United States that all slaves would be free. Although the proclamation declared it in 1862, it did not really go into effect until the 13th Amendment in 1865 at the ending of the Civil War where all men were then uh, released from their bondage of slavery. It was in that year, June 19th of 1865, that all slaves, including those in Texas, were free. And people have been partying ever since. You see, because when you have freedom, it gives you the ability to give God praise. When you have freedom, it gives you the ability to give God glory. So what is true of physical freedom is also true of spiritual freedom. Through the power of Jesus Christ, God wants to set men free. Come on, somebody. Through the power of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God wants to set men free. Why? So that they can be all that God has created them to be. God has created you. God has created me to be something. God did not save you to sit on your do-nothing self, Mother William, and simply do nothing. God has saved us that we can be what God has created us and called us to be. And you will always be oppressed until you seek that goal that God has for your life. That's right. You see, but the enemy doesn't want you to be free. So what the enemy does, they use fear. He uses intimidation. He uses discouragement. He uses deception to keep you bound by sin. Yeah. But God wants to release you from anything or anybody that's trying to hold you captive or that's oppressing you and preventing you from progressing in Jesus Christ. God wants to set his people free, free from the bondage of oppression, free from the bondage of sin. God wants to set you free. And whom the Son sets free, come on, help me somebody, is free indeed. So what is freedom? Freedom means to liberate. It means to let loose. It means to release from bondage. Anything that's illegitimately oppressing you, that's freedom. So what is oppression? Oppression involves and imposes domination on another person or a group of people in order to control them physically, spiritually, emotionally, or mentally. Why do they want to control you? Why do they want to oppress you? Because they want to oppress you because they don't want your aspirations. They don't want your potentials to be manifested. They want to keep you beneath them. They want to keep you in a subservient position. They don't want you to be what God has created you to be. So oppression seeks to restrict you from what God has given as your potential. Oppression wants to keep you from being free. Oppression wants to keep you from being what God has created you to be. The reason why oppression is so bad is because it's men trying to play God. 
It's men trying to tell you what to do in spite of what God is trying to get you to do. There are many kinds of oppression. There's physical oppression, which we know about. We call that slavery. It's where people, uh, uh, they progress at your expense. They progress at the expense of your labor that's produced by someone else. There's racial oppression, where people keep you down simply because of the color of your skin. There's spiritual oppression, where the devil wants to keep you bound. He wants to keep you bound by drugs. He wants to keep you bound by alcohol. He wants to keep you bound by stinking thinking. Yes, yeah, stinking thinking. That's thinking that's not like God. He wants to keep you bound from thinking things that are not godly. He wants to keep you bound from anything or anybody that's going to try to lift you up to where God wants you to be. That's spiritual oppression. And the devil is good at keeping us spiritually oppressed. That's why we've got to get over our past. Because our past will keep us just, just that, in our past. But God wants to set you free from those things that are holding you hostage and keeping you from being what God has called you to be. Well, our lesson today is in the book of Exodus. And I hope you're there because as we close the book of Genesis, the Bible tells us that the Israelites who came into Egypt as 70 souls are now beginning to progress. They're now beginning to, to multiply because God uh, is with them. And God has given a covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And through you, your name, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. So God made a promise to a man by the name of Abraham. And this promise is coming to fruition. So now Joseph uh, is, is, is dying, and the children of Israel have been in Egypt for some 300 years. Their total captivity will be 400 years. But by the time we come into Exodus 1, they've been there about 300 years. They have settled in a land called Goshen, which is in southeast Egypt. Oh, this is good stuff. Yeah. Stay with me now. So, so they've settled in Egypt. For 300 years, they have been a part of the Egyptian society. For 300 years, they have assimilated into the culture or into the place of Egypt. For 300 years now, they are uh, now they're living in South Egypt, but yet they're still in Egypt. They've not done anything threatening. They've not done not anything harmful. They've been productive members of society progressing in Egypt. But the Bible says uh, in Exodus 1 and 8, that now there arose a new king, a new king over Egypt who did not know their history. He did not know about Joseph. He did not know how Joseph had saved the Egyptian people from starvation. He did not know the history of Joseph. By the way, let me just stop right there and say this. It is important, brothers and sisters, particularly you of African-American nature and culture, you need to know your history. You see, the reason why the nation of Islam is exceeding and growing, the reason why uh, the, 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 the Muslim religion, uh, uh, Islam, pure Islam, is growing, the reason why black Hebrewism is growing is because we don't know our history. And we're letting folks tell us that we are evil people, that, that, that we were cursed people, but that's not the truth. We were all created in, I love this, Amado Deo, which is the image of God. We were all created in the image of God. We have a rich heritage in our history, and we need to know our history. But when you don't know your history, the history books will lie and tell you anything. And we believe the history. See, some of us are all excited about being in a Eurocentric culture. But do you not know that the first two to three thousand years of, of civilization was dominated by people of Africa? Yeah. Every nation, every people have had a segment of time in which to, to, to rule. And now it's just the European time to rule for two thousand years. But now you're seeing a coming together of the nations. And so you see where God's plan is working out for his good yeah. and for his glory. Yeah. Well, I don't have time to go into that. I really want to, but we have to say that for February. Come on, somebody up here. Oh, man. So, anyway, the Bible says that there arose a new king. He didn't know about Joseph. And verse 9 is very interesting. It said, uh, verse 9 of chapter 1, 
And he said to his people. And he said to his people. Now see, y'all missed that. That's a racial epithet right there. His people versus the Israelite people. Right there, he has set a racist tone. Come on, somebody. Because they have been there for over 300 years, but they're, they're still his people versus them people. Oh, come on, somebody. And so he said, he said to his, his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. And that, that last phrase means take over the land. And so what, he, what he's saying there is, we got to do something about these people, them people. That's another racial epithet. We got to do something about them people. But the last time I checked, when you become king over a nation, or when you become president, I mean king, you, you, you are president, I mean king, over everybody. You're not just king over your base. You're not just king over the Republican or king over the Democrat, but you're king over the entire nation, not them people and those people. But we see where God, see, look, you got to understand who you are and whose you are. Because when you name the name of Jesus Christ, God is the great equalizer. Nobody can do a, a, anything to you that God does not allow. So the Bible says that he said to his people, we got we to deal with them people. We got to deal truly with them people because we just can't let them continue to multiply the way they multiply. We can't let them keep doing what they're doing. Hence, population control. We got to control that population. Notice, controlling that population means we got to kill the young males. We got to kill the men. And that's what the devil wants to do all the time, is get rid of the young men. By the way, it's why parent, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood is thriving in our communities because it's population control. We got to stop them people from continuing to have babies. So what we do is we put parent, Planned Parenthood in their neighborhood and talk them into having abortions. And, and, oh, come on, help me somebody. Killing out the next generation. Killing our next president. Killing our next lawyers and our doctors because we are aborting our future. Population control. It ain't new. It's nothing new under the sun. So the Bible says in verse 11, therefore they set taskmasters over them. Now I want you to hear this language in the next couple of, uh, of uh, verses because this is language of oppression. Yeah, huh? When you hear this language, you know it's an oppressive person trying to be oppressive over someone else. So therefore they set taskmasters over them. They afflicted them with their burdens and they built for Pharaoh supply cities of Python and Ramses. Uh, in Exodus 1.12, uh, but, but, but the more they heard it afflicted them, the more they multiplied and the more they grew. And they were, uh, and they were in dread of the children, of, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. See, you don't know who you are. See, when you name the name of Jesus Christ, people are afraid of you. Oh, come on, don't put somebody up here. When you name God's name, they are afraid of you. That's why the kingdom suffered violence, because they don't want to do it God's way. Come on, somebody up here. So they were the dread of them, so the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve, that's another oppressive language, with rigor, more oppressive language, and they made their lives, here it is, bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner, here it is, of service, in the field, all their service, which was made, served with rigor. Notice the oppressive language, because the Egyptians begin to oppress them. By the way, let me just say this. See, do you know who the Egyptians are? See, Egypt is in Africa. It's not in the Middle East. It's in Africa. Yeah, These yeah, people yeah. are black. Come on, help me, somebody. Yeah. So everybody can be oppressive. That's why you can't put your trust in people. You must put your trust in God. Yeah, oh, come yeah. on, somebody. Yeah. That's why you name the name of Jesus Christ, yeah. because he is the great equalizer. Yeah. Notice the term of oppression. God's hand was upon them. Because the more they oppress them, the more they prosper. Oh, you didn't hear me. The more they oppress them, the more they prosper. We are in a generation where people want to prosper. Everybody wants prosperity. But do you want the pain that goes with prosperity? Because the more they oppress them, the more they prosper. 
So the king is oppressing them because he wants to build his agenda at their expense. So he continues to press them, but God's hand was upon them. Aren't you glad that God's hand yes. is upon you? Yes. Ah, so yes. he said, oh, I, I love this because Romans 8 31 said, What shall we say to these things? Yes. If God be for you, who can be against you? If God is on your side, who can bring you down? If God is on your side, who can take what you have? If God, come on somebody, if God is on your side, then you can't help but give God the glory because God can prosper you even in your oppression. God can lift you out. Yes, he can. So in chapter 2, we see that they, the reason why God sends Moses to the people is because God wants the people to leave Egypt to go out into the wilderness, here it is, here it is, to worship him. God wants people that will worship him. So he's calling on the Israelites to come out into the wilderness to worship him. But Pharaoh wants them to stay in Egypt and worship him. So we got a battle between the big G-O-D and the little G-O-D. And I want you to know that whenever there's a battle between the big G-O-D and anybody, they're going to lose. That's why you got to name the name of Jesus Christ. That's why you need God on your side. But the problem is the devil doesn't want you to do things God's way. So the devil keeps trying to oppress you while God is trying to free you. Ah, so oppression wants to keep you bitter. Oppression wants to keep you in bondage. But I thank God for him. For in him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our being. So now we get to our verse, verse 2 and 23. So now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. This oppressive king is now died. Because God has a way of getting rid of people. Yeah. God has a way of putting kings and presidents in power. And God has a way of taking kings and presidents out of power. God has a way of putting people in places where he wants them to be. Yeah. But that's why you got to give God the glory. Yeah. That's why you got to give God the honor. That's why you got to know who he is because God is worthy to be praised. By the way, can I say this too? That's why y'all not get all upset when things aren't going the way you think they ought to go. Because they always go the way God wants them to go. Come on, somebody. God is always working behind the scenes in order to pull off the plan that he has for your life. That's why you ought to give God glory. See, the old folks said it this way. Don't wait till the battle's over. You got to learn how to shout right now. You got to learn how to shout in the good times. You got to learn how to shout in the bad times. Because in all times, God is still in control. Oh, I feel like preaching right now. Oh, God is good. He's worthy to be praised. So now the verse says 23. Now it happened in the process of time. It's given enough time, things will change. I love what the missionary Kemp spoke on many, many years ago. Seasons do change. I still remember that. See, in the process of time, the king died. Just hang on in there, brothers and sisters. Coronavirus, seasons do change. Oh, come on, somebody. Just hang on in there. Things do change. If you can just hold on until God unchanged your hand. Don't go weary in your well-doing. Don't fight. Hold on to God. So in the process of time, the king died. And the children of Israel began to groan. Because of the bondage that they were in, they began to cry out. And their cry came up to God. Yes, yes. Because he heard their bondage. He saw their bondage. So they began to groan. The groan means to cry out in agony. Yes. It means to cry out in anguish. Now, notice that when they cried out, they cried out when the king died. Which gives you the impression that up until this time, they ain't been crying. <laughs> uh huh. You see, what, you, you can become dependent on the government. Help me get somebody. You can become dependent on the government. And see, and the government is doing what you want them to do, you don't cry out to God. But the problem is, when you don't cry out to God, that means that you are crying to the government. That means you are in line with the government. But God is saying, you ought to be in line with me all the time. Yeah. Let me give you a help here with it. Yeah. The Bible said, it was in the year that King Uzziah died yeah. that I saw the Lord. When did he see the Lord? When King Uzziah died. In other words, my trust and my hope was in King Uzziah. But when King Uzziah died, I had no one to trust in. So I had to call 
on the name of Jesus. I had to call on the name of Jesus. You ought not have to call on the name of Jesus. You ought to want to call on the name of Jesus. You ought to want to call on the name of Jesus when President Trump is in office. You ought to want to call on the name of Jesus when Barack Obama is in office. You ought to want to call on the name of Jesus no matter who is in office. You ought to want to lift up that holy name because God is worthy to be praised. So now they're crying out to God. And they're crying out. And the Bible, and their, their complaint is coming to God. And they're crying out. They're saying, God, relieve this burden that is on us. Ah, they're crying out. Notice they cried out. Notice that they continue to cry out. And the Bible says that as they begin to cry out, in verse 24, God heard their groaning. Oh, uh, don't you know God was listening all the time? God has said, I'm waiting on y'all to call out. I'm waiting on you to remember me. I come on, see, see you. <laughs> we live in a world where we become so prosperous that we don't cry out to God. We don't have to cry out to God. Because we got master call. We don't have to cry out to God. We got American Express. We don't have to cry out to God. We got insurance. Uh, you see, back in the day, when they didn't have insurance, they cried out to God because there was no place they could take you. They couldn't take you to the doctor, so they gave you some, some castor oil. They, they gave you castor oil for the headache. They gave you castor oil for the heartache. They gave you castor oil when you were itching and scratching. They gave you castor oil when you had a scratch in your They gave you castor oil, and they knew how to cry out to God, calling on the name of Jesus. They got some olive oil and some castor oil. They put the castor oil on the inside and they stuck the olive oil on your head. And they call on the name of Jesus. We got to get back to calling on the name of Jesus. We got to get back to giving God some praise. We got to get back to giving God some glory. You got to get back to giving God some honor. We got to stop trusting your man. Stop trusting in everything else. We got to learn how to depend on Jesus. Anybody want to depend on Jesus today? So they remember the covenant. You see, sometimes God will bring circumstances into your life to get you to remember. So they remember the covenant. They said, oh yeah, we got a God we can call on. Oh yeah, we remember Joseph. Oh yeah, we remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they began to cry out to God. And the Bible said that when they remember God and they begin to cry out to God, when you remember God, you remember that your God is bigger than anything you're going through. When you begin to cry out to God, you understand that God is in control. So verse 7 says of chapter 3, when they cried out to God, that God said, I've heard. I have surely seen the affliction of my people. In other words, God said, your cries have reached up to heaven. That's why you got to learn how to cry to God way over in the midnight hour. You got to learn how to cry to God when everybody else is asleep at night. While you're walking the floor, but you're crying out to God. But the Bible said that, they, that God said, I've seen the affliction of my people. First thing I want you to know is that God sees. Nothing catches God off God. He sees, mother, what you're going through. He sees, father, what you're going through. He sees that child is not doing yeah. what they're supposed to do. He sees those people that are oppressing you. He sees that boss that's keeping you back and not giving you that raise. He sees yeah. those things that are going on in your life. Nothing yeah. catches God off God. But rather than cry out to man, you need to learn how to cry out to God. So the Bible said, I, I've surely seen the affliction of my people. That word seen is the word Jehovah Ra'ah. You need to know that you got a God that's here and that sees what you're going through. You know you, got, you need to know you got a God that gives attention to what you're going through. I know you have some sleepless life, but God is there. I know you got a financial situation you can't go through, but God is there. I know folks are mistreating you, but God is there. Can you say God is there? Because God sees. He sees what you're going through. He sees those who are mistreating you. God sees because he's Jehovah Ra'ah. Oh, but I want you to know that not only does he see, but the Bible said, but God hears your moaning. He not only sees what you're going through, but he hears what you're going through. He hears your cry. 
He hears your moan. He hears your pain. He hears what you're saying, mama. He hears you down on your knees, crying out to the Lord. And you're moaning. You know what's going on, God said, I hear the moans in your body. And I sit down the Holy Ghost to rev up your moans. Because the Bible says the Spirit it makes intercession for you. In other words, I'm my words, I'm so hurt and so bad. I don't even know what to say. So all I can do is just moan. Do we have any moaners in the house? I mean, then you know how to go to the Lord. You know how to go to the Lord in a time of need. And the Bible says the Holy Ghost picks up on that moan. He said, the Father, let me tell you what she's moaning about. She moaning because that boy ain't doing right. She moaning because that husband ain't doing right. She moaning because that daughter's not doing right. She's starting to moan. And when the Bible said, when you begin to moan, God hears your moan. And when God hears, I, I know. And then the Bible goes, and not only do I see what's going on, not only do I hear what's going on, but I know their sorrows. I know what you're going through. I see it, and I hear it, and I know what you're going through. And I can empathize with you. And now Jesus said, I can sympathize with you. Because Jesus said, thoughts have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I know what it's like not to have shoes. I know what it's like not to have a, a house to live in. I know what it's like to have people spit on me and lie on me and talk about me and beat me all day long. I know what it's like to be hung high and lifted up. I know what it's like to be stressed out. But I was hung up for your hang-ups. I was hung up because I see what's going on. I'm hung up because I hear what's going on. And now I know what you're going through. And because I know what you're going through. Oh, help me somebody over here. Guess what? And the Bible said, now I have come down. God said, I see what's going on. I hear what's going on. I know what's going on. And guess what? I can do something about it. So I came. I left my home in glory. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believed upon him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I didn't stay in my home in glory. When I saw your affliction, I came down to come see about you. Aren't you glad that I came down to see about you? And I'm going to give you a blessing. I'm going to bring you up out of this land. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to deal with Pharaoh. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to deal with those Egyptians. In other words, when I bring you out, I'm not just going to bring you out, but I'm going to bring you out with a hot hand. You're going to walk out because they're going to give you all their stuff. They're going to give you their gold. They're going to give you their rings. They're going to give you their earrings. They're going to give you all their stuff. And when you go out, you're not going to go out a lowly slave. You're going to go out with your head held high. Because God knows how to turn things around. He turned it around in your life. And he turned it around in your situation. If God hadn't turned it around, just hold on. Hold on. And don't let go. Hold on. And don't give in.
vineyards you didn't plant, roads that you didn't plant. I'm going to give you the land, but you got to take the land because I'm all right because I'm with you. Oh, man. Let me tell you something. Don't get it twisted. With freedom comes responsibility. I'm going to give you the land, but you got to take it. I'm going to give you freedom but you from oppression, but you got to take the land. In other words, as a free person, God expects something out of you. The Bible said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But God expects something out of you. He expects you to live right. He expects you to live holy. He expects you to walk in the ways of God. God didn't free you to go do anything or nothing. God freed you in order to keep you and to save you and to deliver you into his hands. I want you to know that God, today that God wants to free us from the oppression that is in our lives. You know, when I think about this message, I think about the original rock. Not R-O-C-K, but R-O-C. Yeah. The original rock. I think his name was uh, Charles Dutton. Yeah. The original rock got in some trouble and was actually in prison where he became an actor. Yeah. And he was doing an interview one time. He said, how did you make it? While he was sitting in that prison cell. He said, it was simple. He said, I never decorated myself. I never hung pictures up on myself. I never put, I never made myself home in that cell. I was looking to the time when I would come out of that cell. And I kept my eyes focused on freedom. I kept my eyes focused on something better. And that allowed me to make it during the time that I was in that cell. Stop decorating your cell. And let's move on into the freedom that God has provided us. Yes. Well, I have enjoyed myself today and I've enjoyed the service of today. Thank the Lord for each and every one of you that have come into the house on today. And thank for you that have joined us on this morning. Truly, we thank you for joining us. We pray that you have enjoyed uh, this message. And later today, this message will be on our website, jccogic.org. And we'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock as we talk about more about prayer. Be there at 6 o'clock on tonight on our Facebook Live channel. I want to thank you. I want to praise you. Uh, praise God for, for you being here with us. And we want to say we love you with the love of God. And guess what? There ain't nothing you can do about it. Thank you. Praise the Lord.